Yep, we're going back to the whiteboard, <laughs> the flip chart. The last time we did this, someone was so offended by my drawing, they actually made me a logo for the fruit of the spirit. Robin, I see you. <laughs> we'll work together today, okay? <laughs> um, wasn't last week amazing? Yes. Easter Sunday? It started for a few of us on the beach with a fire, singing some songs, reading some scripture, having a thought from Alan. And apparently it was the loudest, that the swell was the loudest it's been for all these years. Um, very cool. And then we came back here uh, to church where we even had to pull out the seats that we're kind of designated, we're going to throw out because they're so nasty. Uh, so it's, it's amazing. God is, God is good when you have to use the nasty seats. Not the cheap seats, you're in the cheap seats. The nasty seats, the ones that are all faded, uh, it's, it's a sign of what God's doing, uh, but thankfully, everyone got a seat. Um, thank you to everyone who's been involved in the service so far today. Um, for those who've been tracking with uh, the, the different staff announcements, we made some staff announcements, it's on the email, but officially today, Margot, who was leading worship, Margot, um, it's her first official day as our worship pastor whilst leading worship at the same time. We know she's led for months now, but today is the actual first day of her leading in her new role as our worship pastor. So can we just welcome her again? Uh, we're going to have an opportunity to get to know Margot. We'll have a Q&A and get to know a bit of who she is in the weeks to come. Uh, I also just want to welcome everyone who's tuning in online uh, you know what, for everyone who gathers here, it's sometimes a really helpful reminder when we just say, you know what, there's, there's a number of you who join every single week. Maybe right now in this moment, there's maybe not a, like lots who watch live, uh, but there's actually a lot of folk who connect and join every single week. And, uh, and we just, we see you, I mean, we can see everyone here in person. So can we just do a thing? Can everyone just stand up real quick? I'm buzzing this on you really fast. So Mark, maybe go to the side camera. Go to this camera over here on the wall. This was not planned, but why not? And just welcome everyone online. Just say everyone online in that camera. It, it, we're so glad you're connecting with us. Are you good, Mark? That, that kind of worked so, somewhat sort of? Okay. And you're like... I don't know what the internet is. I don't know why there's cameras in the room. Who are we waving at? That's okay. Um, so I'm not speaking the next three weeks um, because next weekend it's the men's retreat and I'm going and I'm speaking because we couldn't find a speaker. I'm joking. <laughs> no, uh, no, I'm speaking. I'm really excited to be speaking. Um, and then the weekend after, um, we belong to a, a network called Vision Ministries as a church. Uh, Vision Ministries has a conference in, in just outside Toronto, so I'm heading over there the weekend after. And then the weekend after that, uh, we're hearing from Young Life and Jamie, just sharing God's word with discipleship and what they're seeing God do here on the peninsula. Uh, so we'll be back. I'll be back speaking May 14th. And then from May 14th until the summer, um, we have a teaching series that we're calling Paradox. Um, someone fed me the idea that Jesus speaks in parables. He often says one thing and intends the meaning to be something else so that only those who are really leaning in close really want to know who Jesus is, really want to know the meaning of life, hear it. So the idea of the paradox is that Jesus continually uses phrases, the first shall be last. If you want to save your life, you've got to lose your life. And to an outsider coming into Christianity, it just sounds like Jesus is awfully confused. So what we want to do over six weeks is just talk a bit about the fact he's not confused. He knows exactly what he's about. And when he speaks that way, it reveals the kingdom of God. It's like a, it's like a window into the kingdom of God that we see through. So uh, paradox happening uh, from May 14th until the summer. And also we have a couple of different people who will be speaking uh, with me uh, in that series. And isn't it just an amazing thing as a church that we've so many people who not only are gifted to speak, but are still saying, yeah, this is something I love to do, I still feel called to do. It's, it's amazing. I know that you all benefit from not just having me speak. I'm big enough to take that in the chin. Uh, but it's just really lovely. So thank you for everyone who's speaking over the next few months. 
Today we want to talk about our vision and our mission. We want to talk about this regularly because it's important that we stay in step with God where we believe he's calling us to go. You'll have hopefully heard me say that our vision is to see Jesus' life expressed so that his love transforms lives. Hopefully that's not new. If you're brand new today, maybe the last month, you might not have heard it. But Jesus' life expressed so that his love transforms lives. That's, that's our vision as a church. That's kind of what we're all about, expressing Jesus' life individually and together as a church. Hopefully, you will have also heard me talk about these three things, lifting up, building in, and reaching out. And that's our mission statement. And here's the deal with, with, with statements and things like this. Here's the deal. You might be asking, Craig, we're the church. We have the Great Commission. Why do we need a vision statement? Let's just get about the business of doing what Jesus said, and then let's be done with it. Why do we need a vision, a vision or a mission statement? Well, here's the reason. With any organization, those who belong to that organization, in our context, this is you, the church of SBF, we should all be able to explain to some degree or another uh, why that organization exists, specifically why SBF exists. For us, we want each one of you to be able to understand and be able to explain that we exist to see the incredible and loving life of Jesus expressed in all we do because we believe it's transformational. And the way that we express that life is from our mission statement by living a life like Jesus's. All organizations face many, many risks. Two of the big ones are that, and especially in a season like we're in, where we're using the nasty chairs for seating on Sunday. There's so many people. What the risk, one of the risks an organization, especially in growth, faces is that everyone gets super busy, runs off in 50 different directions, and as a result, it is undefinable for us all to say what we're about. So someone might say, what's your church about? We're really busy, but I'm not sure I could tell you exactly what we're all aiming at. The other risk is that we all fix our attention solely on one thing. And what that does is it stifles creativity, stifles your calling in ministry to go, to lead, to teach. And it, it stops people using their gifts. Those are the kind of the two risks. So what a mission statement helps is definition. It brings definition to what we're called to do. And what we want to be more than anything as a church. If you could just take away one thing from today. What is the one thing that SBF wants to be about? We truly, completely, and utterly want to be about Jesus. Specifically, a life that we live that reflects who he is. Now, do you remember about a year ago? It was about a year ago that we talked about our mission statement. And we drew this triangle not because there's anything important about triangles. Some of you might be more circle people, square people. I don't, I'm not going there. It's just an aid, a visual help to remind us. Who is here when we introduced the vision and mission about a year ago? Not actually in the room, but who is here in the church when we talked about this? Okay, cool. Not to, not to single anyone out. Who was, who was not here? Who was not here when we introduced the vision, the mission, and the values around this time last year? By my estimation, that's 50-50. So this is why we're talking about it. Because it's really important that each one of us are able to understand and explain to some extent what SBF is all about. So we're about Jesus. Specifically, we're about building up. Sorry, we're lifting up. My mistake. We're about lifting up Jesus in our worship. That's the first of our mission statements where we say, you know, how we be like Jesus is joining him as he lifted up his father, lifted up God in worship. We want to start doing that first thing, lifting up Jesus in our worship. 
Next, we want to build his life, Jesus' life, into one another. It's not good enough that we just simply come on a Sunday and rely on their speaker to do it. We will all want to be building Jesus' life into the fabric of who this church is. And then who can remember this one? Shout it out nice and loud. Out. out. Thank you. It's, it's not just as a church that we want to be about lifting up Jesus in our worship, that we want to build in his life into our church here. It's that we want to reach out with his love, both locally in this area and globally so that people come to know the transformational and incredible good news of Jesus. We've actually been talking a bit about this as a leadership team and as a staff team over the last month here. And if you imagine it this way, if you look at this and you go, okay, this is our mission, what we're trying to explain here is if, as best we can, we're going to jump in our text in a moment or two, as best we can, when we think of these three things, these are things we see Jesus doing. We see it specifically in the text today. But if we do that, I'm hoping that we can come to a common understanding that if we do this, we're living a Jesus-shaped life. If we all do this together, the effect is we have a Jesus-shaped church. It's kind of simple solution. As best we can if we do these things, we will have a Jesus-shaped life. And as best we can if we do this together, we'll have a Jesus-shaped church. You know, some of us are naturally going to be drawn to, to this one. Some of us are just naturally going to be drawn to be up people. We love spending a lot of time in Bible study, devotion to God, heavily involved in our worship services. We just are drawn there. Maybe it's how God's wired us, maybe partly where we feel called to. Some of us are going to be definitely in people. You're probably on our greeting team. I would just encourage you, if you don't like people, please, please don't join the greeting team. <laughs> because you're just wired that way. When someone comes in, you, there's a, like, in you, you're like, I want to know you and I want you to feel part of our community. Some of us are out people. Our heart breaks for the lost. Our heart breaks for injustice. And we feel very strongly drawn and we often feel the church is moving so slow because do you not see the work that needs to happen and you're so busy doing services? We're all a mixture of all. Ephesians 4.11, Paul says, Jesus himself made us different. Ephesians 4.11, Jesus makes us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We're not gonna overlay those here. It's just a point to say Jesus himself has kind of wired us differently to one another, given us different gifts. And so when we look at this, we're all going to look at it a little bit differently. And that's okay. We're all different. So what does our passage encourage us with today? Luke 6, 12 to 19. In our desire to become like Jesus, to study and learn from his life, we can see, I can see three things three dimensions, you could say, three attitudes, three focuses that his life revolved around. So we're going to read it together. This time, we'll just pause between each thing. Verse 12, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. That's up. This is not one place in scripture we read Jesus doing these things. It's just a nice example where he does it what looks like fairly systematically, fairly obviously together that Luke captures for us. One of those days, Jesus went out on a mountainside to pray. He left what was happening and he went by himself to pray and he spent the night praying to God. That's up. Verse 13, when morning came, he called his disciples to him and he chose 12 whom he also designated apostles. That's in. Jesus goes from up, comes in, calls people to himself, and chooses from this larger group that are known to him, he chooses 12 to have special, intentional relationship with. 
Note, he didn't say, Jesus called the 12 down. Note, Jesus, verse 13, when morning came, he called his disciples to him and he chose 12 from the disciples. This is one of the things that blew my mind in scripture because I always, thought, I always kind of thought Jesus just chose 12 people and had this highly intentional relationship with them. It almost felt like, a, like an ex, too exclusive, almost. But when you begin to realize in parts of the New Testament, Jesus has followers, sometimes called disciples, and then he has apostles, also some, sometimes called disciples. And it gets a bit confusing to know which one you're looking at. But here, Luke clearly shows us Jesus had a crew. He had a posse. He, he had people he was close to, relationship with. And from those people, he chooses 12. Verse 17, moving on. He went down with them and he stood in a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there. Again, see this, this language. A large crowd of his disciples was there. We're not told how many. We're not talking of the 12 apostles because 12 is not a large crowd. Jesus goes down to this place. There's a group and then there's a larger group listening and Jesus begins to teach them. That, of course, is out. Verse 12 shows us that Jesus has this incredible relationship with his father. Verse 13 shows us that he has this incredible relationship, this intentionality around developing people that are his followers, disciples, and apostles. And then verse 17 shows us Jesus has this amazing desire and relationship to draw people in who are not in already. He draws people in from out. Those far from God, the searching and the broken. So here's the thing. This is a great little snapshot in scripture that we see Jesus repeating in other places. Jesus, he, he carves out time. Often when you think it's the greatest moment for Jesus to put the foot on the gas, to make a bigger name for himself than he currently is, to teach and preach the kingdom coming, what do we find Jesus doing? Oh, I just need to be with my father. And he sends the disciples away. He hops on a boat or he goes for a walk or he climbs a mountain. Why? Not because he's, he's scared of people. It's because he's seeking relationship with his father. Such is his desire to be in relationship with his father that he finds the space. He goes after it and he finds it. I think it's also important for us to note in this context, Luke starts with up. Jesus went away, spent time praying with his father. Now, this is an important moment. He is choosing the 12 to be the leaders of the future church. So it's an, it's, it's, it's an important moment. He goes away. He doesn't start with a conversation. Then he says, let's go to prayer. He goes himself and he prays and he seeks out God in that moment of relationship. You see, folks, everything else we do in the church flows out of the relationship we establish with God. It's tempting and somewhat easy to put really gifted, and, you know, gifted professional folks up, have them lead lots of stuff, they'll get a following, and let's hope God blesses it along the way. It's not a model we're interested in. We want everything we do to flow out of a relationship with God. And I'll just say this. A couple of us were mildly disappointed that on our prayer night, let's just say I would, have, I would love to encourage more of us to attend that. If everything we do flows out of our relationship with God, individually and corporately, we can't rely on gifting and people and how passionate people are, and how much time we have, we have to go to God in prayer. We have to, we have to, we have to. So the first Sunday of every month, I just want to challenge you. Why is it not on your calendar? It's in my calendar because I'm the pastor. Would it be if I wasn't? Hard question. 
If not, why not? Hard question. If everything flows out of relationship with him, it starts with up. If everything does, let's come to God with intentionality. We also then read around scripture of other places where Jesus pulls his disciples away. Like I said, in that moment, when you think everything is, a, you know, this is a moment for Jesus to be teaching, Jesus says, let's just go and do something else. Let's eat, let's walk. Jesus is amazing at inviting people into relationship. We all know his first miracle, turning water into wine. Jesus wasn't, someone who isolated himself from other people. He intentionally sought God, but he didn't isolate himself. He wasn't a loner. He loved having people around. He loved eating with people and dining with people and getting to know people and finding out their story. It's the most amazing thing about, when you read the, the, the Old Testament, so the New Testament, you go, wow, this, this guy liked people. He really, really loved building relationship. If you know a bit about the New Testament, you know that Jesus tried to kind of set up a bit of a faith community in his hometown, but people were like, yeah, you're just Jesus who lives down the road. Who are you? And so he kind of finds himself moving to a place where, the, where the, it was easier and the, the soil was more fertile to establish a faith community, a people that would be his followers. So he moved to Capernaum and then he created this amazing model of a faith community that the, new, the, the, church in the, early, the early church just copied and replicated. But in Capernaum, Jesus goes and everything we read in the New Testament and Acts about that place was Jesus, his attempt to draw people into the story of God. You see, such as Jesus' desire for fellowship, that he chooses a group and he invites them deep. It's hard as a church like us just now to experience deep community like we did a moment ago and half the congregation, half folks here today are new in the last year. You see, the model we read about in the New Testament is likely going to be smaller than our context today. So you can kind of look and go, oh, I can see how that's easier and that you don't know how busy I am. And we can find so many ways at discounting ourselves from what Jesus was really doing in Capernaum. He was finding a people and he was journeying with them in relationship. There's a word we talked about a few months ago, this word oikos, not like the yogurt, but the Greek word meaning family. And what Jesus creates is a spiritual family. If you belong to this place, I just want to encourage us. Like God is, God is doing great things. And on Wednesday when we had the seniors gathering and when we have lots of other ways of people connecting, I said to the seniors, I said, you know what? With all the great things that happen, all the different ministries, that we, we love it, it's exciting. But as the church of God, the people... We have to be meeting together in places and contexts like that. So I'll just be really straightforward. Do you find yourself coming to church every week and really loving connecting? You really love meeting people, but then you go away and you feel quite disconnected and actually quite lonely and isolated from the church the rest of the week. I just want to say, like, I desperately want to help you connect. I really want to help you take a step forward, whatever that looks like for you, to really help connect here with the church. It's so important. It's, you know, it's less connecting with the, the SBF church. It's much more connecting with the person sitting next to you, building relationship. You know, I know a number of folks are saying, Craig, I'd love to join a small group. How does that work? Well, just come and talk to me. I'd love to help you find a place to belong. But Jesus does it. Relationship with God, relationship with his disciples, and the, you know, disciples and apostles. And then we read of the relationships that Jesus builds with the lost and the broken, without. You know, relationships that lead to transformation. It's interesting that Jesus 
challenges this group by continually seeking relationship with this group, right? I mean, in our day, we might go, oh, that feels a little bit awkward. They're not like me. In Jesus' day, that was like, someone needs to stop him. It's either children, it's women, it's slaves, it's people in the street. Jesus intentionally befriends, in some ways, culturally, all the wrong people for a young rabbi like he was. And Jesus continually corrects everyone who is trying to stop him. Why? Because Jesus invites everyone. He seeks relationship with everyone. Such is his desire to bring God's love into the world that he finds people to love. In each of these areas, Jesus develops relationship. Just think of it like this, like we did last time. I think we had a TV last time, so I'll do my very best. This is a stool. How many legs more, how many more legs do we need to make this thing stable? One, right? It's a terrible stool, Robin, you'll send me a diagram, thank you very much. (laughs) Um, Here's the thing. We need each of these things to be the church. Pull one leg out and the stool falls over. And in some way, we need to develop a really awesome, wholehearted relationship with God, with one another, and then with the world in which we live. Being a Jesus-shaped church. I think, as I've seen over the years, been at conferences, worked in different churches, spoken to lots of pastors over many years, I think there's a general consensus that lots of churches excel in one or two, maybe just naturally, you know, if, you're, if you'd ask anyone, well, what's SBF like? I think one of the things we excel at naturally is being highly invitational, is being like a, like a family church where everyone really wants to know everyone else. And because there's that, you know, under piece that's been there forever, SBF, we really want to be a family church. There's a piece there that, let's just call this in this side, there's a piece there that this is a strong leg. We're probably very never going to like fall off on this one because this is really important to us. I would probably say the same. Again, this is me being here almost a two years. I think SBF has had a strong and long tradition of really emphasizing our discipleship and relationship with God. And so it should. Really important. But when I interviewed almost two years ago, maybe almost two years ago, yeah, now, like April or May or so. Um, What is the church? Where is it wanting to go? What's it seeking? And this question came up, just how missional does, does this church want to be? Or is it willing to be? And I think in some ways, the piece that's been a, there's been pockets of it. There's been a desire for it. There's people who are leading in this and it's wonderful. But as a collective, it might be over the years, one of the areas that is now a time for us to really seek God about what's next is around out. And if you've ever sat on a stool and one of the legs is a little bit shorter than the other one, it's not that it wasn't happening. It's just that sometimes you can kind of feel yourself swaying. And I think honestly, churches go through seasons when they probably emphasize one over the other. But as a congregation, what that feels like is that you kind of find yourself swaying a little bit, maybe based upon upon what what the leaders are selecting, what we're suggesting, Personally, when I first heard this and I saw this, I was devoting a lot of my time to teaching, leading worship, serving in the up and the in. Taking a lot of my effort, a lot of my time. Um, I used to go to one worship service on a Sunday morning, another on Sunday evening. I'd usually be doing something on a Sunday afternoon, seeing people. And, that was, uh, and then Sunday evening was youth, youth ministry. And that was just Sunday eight o'clock till 10 o'clock. It's very easy to fill our lives with one of these at the expense of other. You see, when someone first said to me, Craig, would you ever think of not being so busy on Sunday so you can have people back in the house and have relationship building, getting to know people? It was genuinely a new thought. You might be like, 
okay, <laughs> which rock have you been under? For me, it was a new thought because I thought I was serving God in exactly the way he wanted me to serve. But all of a sudden, this idea of be a little bit less busy with one of these areas because I was out of balance. You would say like, this one was like really long and then probably I was doing it with a lot of, you know, I was spending time with people in relationship, but had very little time and space. If someone came to the church or one of my friends I played soccer with, whatever that thing might be, I had very little, little margin in life beyond work and then church and everything else to then commit to any kind of relationship with someone who wasn't in my world in the church. Does this make sense? It's very easy for us to fill our lives up with the things that we think are really important. Remember, we're all pre-wired and pre-lean towards one of these. So this is not bad church, bad Craig. This is like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. You see, when we demonstrate a Jesus-shaped life where he doesn't only teach or he doesn't only spend time in isolation and relationship. He didn't fill his time. I love that he challenged folk when he built relationship with people who were not in the club, who were not part of the disciples or the apostles. He draws people in. Some of my favorite memories, in fact, when I look back, are, are not just times with God, although that's amazing. Personally, I actually love when I look back on a time and kind of remember together, oh yeah, I remember the people we lived that season with and God was so good and we had so much fun together learning about God, experiencing God, but the memories and the faces I remember are just imprinted in my mind of who those people were. Still in touch with them today, 25 or so years later. Deep relationship, not just with God, but deep relationship with others. And other, other times I can look back over the years, um, when, when the light bulb goes off and people get that God loves them, he get that, they get that Jesus loves them, that he died for them. Those are some of my favorite moments in ministry where you're most recently, I guess, over Zoom online doing Alpha. And this one of the guys in our group was saying, uh, you know, my wife is a Christian. I, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not sure if I'm interested, but I've got nothing else to do. It's COVID. <laughs> so what am I going to do? And he comes on and he's with us on, on Zoom. And amazingly, his wife had this uh, pretty significant illness, has had for about five years. And, uh, and he said one week in Alpha, you do a, a session on, on healing. And he said, you know, she, can I just ask you, I don't know how this works, but can can you just pray for her? She's, she wasn't even on Zoom, but like, can you just pray for her? Uh, he was an oil worker, worked up in Fort Mac, lived in Calgary. He was at Fort Mac in his little house thing, um, one, 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 you know, the, like the, the oil, oil and gas camps. And so he's miles away and he's like, can you just pray for her? Because she's suffering and I, I, I don't know how this works, but you're asking for prayer requests, so that's mine. So we pray. And then next week he comes on and we're like, how, how, is, how are you doing? How's your wife? And he said, oh, actually, I, I don't know how to say this. Like we, when we were praying, the moment we were praying, um, she just felt God was like, yeah, I'm, I've, just, I've just healed you. And for like years, she'd been to doctors, neurologists, lots of symptoms that were unexplainable, really struggled. And in a moment, God healed her. Truly amazing, miraculous. He didn't have a faith didn't have the context to know exactly how that happened, nor I'm sure any of us really do have a full understanding of how God heals, but he had absolutely no understanding. And yet over the course of Alpha, he'd come to see that God is good, God loves him. He maybe didn't receive it or believe it, but he was beginning to see these things. And then we're sitting one day and he, he, he says this, he said, well, I guess I can't deny it anymore. And you don't wanna push, oh, what, can't you deny anymore? And he said, well, it's got to be true. It's got to be true, right? Those are some of my favorite moments. And it wouldn't have happened if I had just been here or if I'd just been here. So church, this is me asking and saying, God wants to do that time and time and time again. 
He wants us to be looking back in the years to come with moments in this season, remembering the nasty chairs. Do you remember we had to pull out the nasty chairs for a while because there was people coming and we're building a new sense of relationship with people? Do you remember when we did Alpha? There's an Alpha starting like this week. Bryn, right? It's like, it's just, what's that? Tomorrow. There's an Alpha tomorrow kicking off, right? And we can look back in the months and the years to come and say, do you remember when that happened? And I was part of it. And it wasn't just about one or the three of these. It was all three together. We want to be a people who love deeply whatever the situation we find ourselves in. However the church grows or changes, we want to endure patiently. We want to surrender our preferences regularly. We want to cheer loudly when someone has a victory. And we want to be a community that believes its purpose here is living a Jesus-shaped life, is being a Jesus-shaped church where we lift up, we build in, and we reach out. You know, a Jesus-shaped church should be a fun place to belong to. It should be somewhere that God is just amazing us and taking our breath away. Just gonna quickly do this. How much time we got? Yeah, I got a couple minutes. Okay, so there's one more thing. I'll pull this back over. Um, Here's some of the tendencies that churches can get into, and this is not a criticism of anyone, so please stop yourself from thinking of other contexts like this. This is speaking to us as a church, not individually, but as a church. Sometimes we get churches that are kind of, this is the emphasis, up and in. Great worship, strong internal community, but little impact outside. Then maybe... Up and outer. These are this is up and inners, we like to call them. This is up and outers. Strong teaching. Lots of outreach. Strong evangelism. But dysfunctional community. And then here, in and outers. Strong relationships with one another. But drifting away from a biblical standard, Christ-centered worship. If you decide, this is where I'm landing, these are things we're going to talk about. These are things we want to, as a leadership team, be held accountable by you to. Hey, Craig, it feels like we're just hitting so hard this evangelism thing. We, we really need to talk about community. Yes, we do. Hey, Craig, we're, we're, we're so focused on, you know, Bible classes, nothing wrong with Bible courses, but it feels like we're missing opportunity just to be and build relationship. Absolutely, you're right. These are conversations you can have with us. Craig, it feels like it's all about belonging. And, and I'm worried that we're kind of drifting on some standards that we, I think Jesus would hold us to. Absolutely a valid conversation for us to be having. So if you decide this is where I'm landing, this is my church, big picture, that's where we're going. That's who God is calling us to be. More than any program we can put on, relationship is what counts. Relationship with God, with one another, and then with the world that he has planted us in, in this place. And we've talked about just as we go about accomplishing this, as we focus on discipleship, as we focus on building community, as we focus on evangelism, as we focus on justice and healing rest, just these areas that we, we go, yeah, these are the things that we feel our area needs. These are the things we feel our church needs. So if you're, if you're actively involved in our services, in a home group, small group, Bible course, Man, if you're, if you're putting into this church by putting into the up, um, keep going. Keep doing that. Because we have to have a Christ-centered approach. It's so important. If, if your heart beats for community, and it's about like, man, like, put, me on, put me on the door. Like, yeah, I mean, it's interesting that that is actually our biggest team. There's like 40 people on the greeting team. <laughs> um, but we all know that greeting is saying hello, actually building 
deep relationship takes all of us. But if you're finding yourself like, I'm gonna come to the seniors gathering, I'm gonna serve. Yeah, I wanna pray for the mums and babes group. You know, men's breakfast, I'm there, men's retreat. Because your, your heart beats for community, then keep going. Keep suggesting, keep dreaming. Keep asking God what he would have us do. Maybe for some of us, our heart is for evangelism. We just know that God wants to use us. And that's not arrogant. That's just a sense of conviction in your heart. There's Alpha starting, there's Common Grounds on Wednesday, and there's so much more to come. For some of us, he's calling us into justice, where we stand alongside those who have experienced or are still experiencing injustice. Some of us are going to go and get in a plane and fly places to see that calling take life in our own lives. Some of us are going to just drive very locally to an area. Some of us are going to be prayerfully considering what it looks like to walk alongside our indigenous brothers and sisters, our neighbors, who we live next to and around, who have experienced injustice, and the church has a role to play so that injustice would stop. And then finally, healing rest. This is maybe the hardest to define, but almost the most important. For we can be so busy for God, we stop enjoying him. We stop enjoying him. You know, I was thinking that these care packages, we so want to experience the rest of God, the healing rest, the goodness of God in our lives. That I, think, I think the care packages that are going to schools I was thinking about, I think that's what they are. You know, we so want our teachers to be blessed knowing that God just cares enough that he wants you to sit in your staff room with, hopefully with a smile and a cup of tea or coffee in your, in your hand and, and a baked good or a little treat that someone has given to say you deserve to know that we love you, that we care for you. Just this thing of healing rest. So that's where we're going. And if you're, if you're in, it's my, I wouldn't be doing you a favor if I didn't call us occasionally to accountability on some things. So my call really is to say, how are you participating in this? Do you find yourself an upper and inner, an, an inner and outer, or upper and out, whatever the thing is, you know, I know language sounds a bit dumb, but do you, can, you, can you relate and what are you going to do about it? Can you relate? Who are you going to talk to about it? Can you relate? Can you make a plan? Can you put something in your calendar that says, I will commit. I will put an emphasis on this because I know, I know it's the weak leg, right? This isn't, this isn't like big, awful, how bad are we? This is just recognizing we're probably got two of these doing really good. And I was with the leadership team. Okay, I, I will stop in a second, but... <laughs> With leadership team, we're kind of like, here's the maybe the perfect, you know, this is what we want, this kind of triangle. There's times where I'm like, that's my triangle, right? We're out, should be here, and it kind of feels like I've just taken all focus off it. Or maybe your triangle is really flat, right? Just, do, you see the, do you see the point here? This is a helpful tool where you can grab a napkin or a piece of paper and say to someone, draw your triangle for me because I'd like to pray for you. I'd like to walk alongside. Can we do this together? Can we just, if you're in a prayer group, if you're in a discipleship group, I would encourage you, draw your triangle, not for a sense of judgment, so that you can ask God his help. You can include, you can bring the community in to walking with you on this. Let's pray. And if the worship team want to come up, that'd be great. God, we just take a moment. We take a moment to think and reflect that you have called us here to this church. And what's before us, this invitation to follow Jesus into his way of living. Each of us now, Jesus, we would like to hear from you by your Holy Spirit Firstly, an encouragement. So as we pause now, just allow God to speak an encouragement to you. 
just wait for him to say, here's where I think you're doing really well. Just pause. God, we thank you for that. We thank you that you are leading us and you're guiding us and you're giving us direction and you're giving us help with which, whichever one of these we feel good with. Maybe there's someone today and you're thinking, I'm failing on all of them. Well, I think God would say, you're being too hard on yourself. God, thank you for the ways that you are leading us creatively to lift up, to build in, and to reach out. Now, God, we want to pause again. And we just want to ask a question. God, what are you saying to me about the one that needs the most help? Let's just pause and ask God. God, we thank you that you have put this before us, that there's maybe an area that we've not been giving attention to. And it's not that we're bad Christians. It's just that this is a helpful recalibration. So, Jesus, we invite you with our calendars, with our schedules, with our priorities, with the lives that we lead, would you help us know how to respond? Because we want to live a Jesus-shaped life. We want to live the way Jesus modeled for us, where he goes and he develops an amazing relationship with you, Father. And he develops an amazing relationship with his disciples and his apostles. And he develops these amazing, life-giving relationships with those who are not, not in his world, not in his oikos. Thank you, God, that there is no judgment here with this. This is about you creating and forming the church that you want us to be. Thank you also that, as we've said, some of us are just naturally, we just lean one way or another. And when we come together, we kind of bring, we kind of bring it all together in a bit more of a balance. Thank you for the way that you've created us. Thank you for the passions you've put on our heart. Thank you for the callings on our heart. And God, we just say yes to you. We'll go where you lead. We'll follow you. We'll, we, we'll, we'll do our best to be the church that you seek. Lifting up Jesus, building in his life into the people that belong here and reaching out in his love locally and globally so that people can experience the incredible life-transforming news of Jesus. Amen.